is. Throughout time, it's been a symbol of Malay pride and valor. But in the light of an age of knowledge, the pen has emerged the mightier. Malay nationalism, which emerged during British rule, found its expression in the early writings published by the Malay press. It was people like Muhammad Yunus Abdullah and Dr. Abdul Samad Haji Paga who sowed the seeds of a Malay consciousness. In the early 19th century, the Malays were concentrated on lands set aside by the British administration. The rural setup gave them a sense of security and stability. The closeness of the community brought about by shared customs and their binding Islamic faith. Much of this idyllic rural life no longer exists, yet the spirit of Kampong life still lingers in Geelang Sarai. It was the result of one man's dream, to set aside land for a Malay settlement at a time when housing for Malays were poor and inadequate. In recognition of this, the main road passing through this area continues to bear his name. Yunus' achievement has to be seen in the context of his time. British policy encouraged the preservation of the traditional Malay way of life. Vernacular schools were set up in the kampongs. The broader education offered in the English medium schools were for a privileged few. In a way, the majority of the Malays were cocooned from the changes taking place beyond the kampongs. But schooling did bring about literacy and the consciousness of their culture. It saw the beginnings of Malay literature, which was to further stimulate intellectual exchange, leading to the issue of the first Malay language paper in the region, the Jawi Puranakan in 1876. This period of intellectual ferment was to eventually reach new heights in the hands of a man who was to be the prime mover of Malay journalism. His influence was to bring new thinking within the Malay community. His name was Muhammad Yunus Abdullah, and his deeds left an imprint on the lives of the Malays. Kampong Glam, once the seat of Malay royalty. It was here that Yunus was born. His parents had settled here from Sumatra, Yunus received his early education at a nearby Malay school. He was well accepted by the aristocrats, being himself a son of a wealthy Minangkabau merchant. And this also made it possible for him to obtain the best education at Raffles Institution, where he graduated from in 1894. He was one of the few Malays with an English education, and after five years in government service, Yunus was invited by William Makepeace, owner of the Singapore Free Press, to edit the Malay version of that paper, the Utusan Melayu. Yunus went on to become the editor of yet another Malay paper, the Lembaga Melayu. The Malay press founded by Yunus was to flourish for the next 15 years. His editorial columns provided moderate views, at times mildly critical of government policies, especially those which concerned the progress of the Malays. This was to prepare him to take on a position of leadership. Until then, the leadership of the Muslim community was in the hands of the wealthy Arabs and the English-educated Indian Muslims under the banner of the Prasakatuan Islam Singapura. 
In appealing to the middle class, the group had ignored the plight of the ordinary Malays. The Malay intellectuals of the day began to question their role. Yunus and others like him felt that they had to do something about providing an alternative leadership. Soon, Yunus and his group of friends was to win the support to form another legitimate group to speak up for the Malays. And Yunus was to take the lead. of our people, especially on the education for our children. The decision was timely, as the British were then looking for another Asian representative to the Legislative Council. In April 1924, Muhammad Yunus Abdullah became the first Malay to take the oath as a member of the Legislative Council. Yunus, like many other community leaders of his time, was concerned about education. While Malay parents would dutifully see their children off to school, Yunus realized that the Kampong schools did not prepare the boys for working life. To that end, Yunus was to start the first ever trade school for these boys. This was to be just one of his projects. Walaupun Cik Yunus sudah berada di dalam Legislative Council, tetapi kita masih perlu sokongan orang-orang Melayu yang lain. Although there was some success, Yunus soon realized that he needed to enlarge his organizational support and increase his Malay following if he was to push through more of his ideas. Dr. Samad, then an undergraduate who was to be the first Malay doctor, was one of those present at a meeting held at the Istana Kampong Glam. Dr. Samad would later continue in Yunus' footsteps. That momentous meeting marked the birth of the Kesatuan Melayu Singapura, the Singapore Malay Union, the first Malay quasi-political party in 1926. Yunus became the first president of the Kesatuan Melayu. At the time, the Malays were scattered all over the island, displaced with every new development. They went further inland and lived in squatter areas in very poor conditions. Yunus, with the support of the Kesatuan Melayu Singapura, actively campaigned for a Malay settlement. Under pressure, the government agreed and purchased 620 acres of land at Kampong Batak for the project. The land set aside was to become Kampong Melayu. Yunus' only living relative is a granddaughter, Alima. She was born two years after Yunus' death, but recalls her parents' accounts of a grandfather. The Malay settlement was later extended to include Kaki Bukit and Geelang. And even today, Geelang Sarai remains an enclave of the Malays. No matter how far they are, many still come back to shop or just soak in the air. But even in these modern settings, the Kampong spirit still lives on. A fine tribute to the man who made it possible, Muhammad Yunus Abdullah. Muhammad Yunus bin Abdullah died in 1933. 
but what he had started gathered momentum. Many more young Malays, especially the English educated, were inspired to continue in their fight for the Malay cause. Amongst those who continued to pursue that cause was Dr. Abdul Samad Haji Paga. Abdul Samad was born in 1902 of Bugis parentage and was to become the first Malay doctor, making a statement of his Malay identity by keeping his sonko on all the time. Those who knew him remembered his quiet and homely ways and of his keen interest in his books. He came from a rich Bugis family but despite this, he was often concerned about those less fortunate. He chose the medical profession so that he could offer his services to the poor. After Yuno's death, Dr. Samat worked with the Kasatuan Malayu Singapura, serving as its president for a year. Dr. Samat was an undergraduate when he helped Yuno set up the union. He made an appeal in the Malayan Tribune for support. My purpose in writing this letter is to draw the attention of my fellow Malays to the present backward condition of their community, which I believe is chiefly due to the non-unity amongst them. A unifying sense of pride was brought about with Dr. Samad's graduation in 1928. The entire Muslim community came together to celebrate. A tea party was held in his honor at the residence of a wealthy Arab. Because of his studies and work, Dr. Samad married late to a Halima Mahmud. They had six children. <laughs> Dr. Samad was a major influence in the lives of those close to him, especially his sons and nephews. His eldest nephew, Ahmad Yasin, was to follow in his uncle's footsteps. After a 28-year lapse, Yasin became the second Malay doctor in Singapore. Dr. Yasin recalls how his uncle fought the mindset against English education, how he persuaded his sister to send her daughter Maimuna to Raffles Girls' School. Their Malay friends were shocked, for they thought it unnecessary to send their daughters to school, especially to an English school. Maimuna later went on to become a headmistress of a girls' school in Kuala Lumpur. The Japanese occupation was a time of hardship and suffering for all. Dr. Samad maintained his familiar quiet calm in the face of adversity and tried to help ease the suffering wherever he could. The doors to his dispensary at Southbridge Road were open to anyone who needed medical attention. Dr. Samad would often charge his patients according to their means. If he realized that the patient was poor and could not afford his fees, he would give his treatment free of charge. He would then make a symbol at the corner of the prescription to indicate so. Another nephew who used to help Dr. Samad at the dispensary was Ismail. He recalls the compassion his uncle displayed. I begin to realize that he was always touched by the difficult circumstances. Although he did give compassionate uh, no treatment to non-Muslim families, but especially our people, he wouldn't hesitate to give them free of charge. He was holding uh, a position where among our people, quite few have achieved that level of education and so on. 
he, he somehow became more and more concerned, you know, for the less fortunate. At the end of the war, Indonesia declared itself a republic in August 1945. This was to mark their long road to freedom from Dutch control. It was a struggle which Dr. Samad could empathize with. Well, there is a feeling of kinship, you see. After all, they come from the same rumpun, isn't it? So they feel that if Indonesia could get independence, it would pave the way for better things for the people on this side of the, the Straits of Malacca. Meanwhile, in Singapore, the spirit of nationalism was widespread. Dr. Samad shared the same kind of anti-colonial sentiments. When he was contacted by the freedom fighters from Indonesia, he willingly agreed to help them in their struggle. His dispensary became the venue for clandestine meetings. They saw in Dr. Samad someone who could help raise the money they needed to carry out their plans. There are also some young people who is involved in other aspects of fight for independence, such as providing arms and so on. So that's how I came to see them drawing plans for bringing certain weapons by means of a sailing boat or motorboat. Huh? Dr. Yasin recalled vividly how his uncle was asked to provide a boat which could transport a crate of arms across to Indonesia. This was to be done in the still of the night. After the war, Dr. Samad became a member of the advisory committee under the British military administration. I hope you can help me. It was during this time that he met and became friends with a well-connected Chinese gentleman who was willing to give financial help for medicine. So that we can fight for our independence. Dr. Samad not only provided shelter for their leaders, but also made it possible for the Indonesian delegation to attend the United Nations conference at New Delhi to discuss Indonesia's fate. In 1946, Indonesia finally gained its independence. Sukarno remembered Dr. Samad's help and offered him a post in his government, but Dr. Samad declined. Instead, he turned his attention and energies to the development of self-determination in Singapore. He and a few others like John Laycock helped to set up the Progressive Party, the first multiracial political party in August 1947. In 1949, he contested in the first elections of the Municipal Commission under the Progressive Party flag and won the seat in a predominantly Chinese area. His achievement was to characterize Singapore's move into a new political arena, where multiracialism was to become the cornerstone of its political development. And this was to set Singapore in the direction towards self-rule and eventual independence. This process of realizing self-determination was hastened by bringing about a new thinking within local communities. Dr. Samad and others like him were instrumental in doing just this. With the community, definitely I think that uh, he more or less uh, set the trend that uh, a Malay could, could, if he or she wanted to, um, achieve a very high level of education. He was um, definitely uh, somebody who could inspire the generation after his to make the best of life and succeed. Dr. Abdul Samad Haji Paga died at the age of 50 in 1952. What he and Yunus accomplished could well be forgotten in the pages of history. But as the saying goes, the tiger dies leaving behind his stripes. The seeds these men planted were the beginnings of a Malay consciousness, bringing about institutions which have worked for the good of future generations. And their achievements 
linger as the harbinger of a new dawn for the Malays.